Um, EMDR is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. It was discovered kind of accidentally by a psychologist in New York who was working primarily with um, Vietnam War veterans. And what is with, that? Her name is Francine Shapiro. She was working with Vietnam War veterans and with women who'd been raped. She was working with PTSD, with people with flashbacks, nightmares, um, classic symptoms of PTSD. Um, and around that time, she was doing research and she also had a diagnosis herself of cancer, I think. And she, the story goes, she was walking through Central Park thinking about her own personal trauma and noticed that um, her eyes were moving from side to side, kind of spontaneously, I think, and that, that started to reduce the level of distress she was feeling. So she did research on using eye movement with the uh, population she was doing research with, the, the patient population. And so EMDR developed. Um, there are various explanations for why it works, none of which I think people are totally satisfied with at the moment. Initially it was thought that um, it linked to the rapid eye movement you get during dreaming sleep. Because when you do eye movement in therapy, it's rapid, short bursts. Um, and it was thought that the rapid eye movement you get during dreaming sleep linked to processing memory. Um, and that you were stimulating that artificially in a, in a therapy session to begin to move people forward. Um, other explanations would be that it's um, connecting the, the right and left half of the brain as you do some kind of bilateral stimulation because you can also use headphones with alternate taps just in each ear or tap the backs of people's hands to create left-right connection across the, the halves of the brain. It also, if you do it with brain scans, shows that you begin to change the activity in the brain and there's increased activity in the frontal lobes. Um, if you look at a brain scan of someone who's extremely traumatised, there's very little brain activity and most of it's in very specific areas in the back of the brain and in the limbic system and the brain stem and the frontal lobes have almost completely shut down. So it's a kind of physical reaction to... Well, it's functional. If, if, you, if you think about the brain, the brain stem comes up the back of your neck into a ball and that's the reptilian brain at the back of your head. Um, and it's, it's the brain any reptile has. It, it's, it's designed to keep you alive, to keep your heart beating, to keep your lungs going, to keep vital functions going. And when you're in danger, it will flood adrenaline through your body so that you can fight or run away. Um, next to that, or around that, you've got the limbic system, which is about emotional um, memory, emotional stuff. And around that, the big frontal lobes. Now here, between the limbic system and the reptilian brain, you have the amygdala, which detects danger. It's not sophisticated, it recognises patterns. So the lizard walking along sees a long shape. It doesn't go and say, oh, is that a stick or a snake? It, it goes fast. It might run away from a lot of sticks, but it won't get eaten by the snake. So it's patterns that are recognised. So a woman that's raped by a man wearing a red shirt may catch the colour red out of the corner of her eye and her body will start to flood adrenaline because this part of the brain is saying red means danger after that event. Um, and she may not even be aware of it. You've also got here the hippocampus, which lays down memory. Um, so the hippocampus will tell you roughly how long events lasted, how far back in time they are. That switches off during a traumatic event if you're in a life-threatening situation because it's too slow. Um, so me trauma memories are fragmented. An image here, a gut feeling there, a sound, and, and you don't get a sense of time. People don't, often don't know how long a trauma's lasted. So you say after a car accident, it seems like time slowed down. I thought that lasted for an hour when it was in fact maybe 30 seconds. Um, so this part of the brain reacts in, I think it's seven thousandths of a second. If this part of the brain thinks there's danger, it will flood adrenaline through. The front of your brain takes half a second to react. So it just switches off in trauma, almost totally, and you react from here. 
You don't want to stop and think if the boss is coming towards you, shall I go this way or that way? You want to go the way the lizard goes, fast. So it lays down memory differently and it shuts down the rational part of the brain. Now, if you're then left with the patterns here, you keep reacting to them. The smell of lavender, the sound of a guy whistling because your stepfather whistled as he came up the stairs and you knew what was going to happen next. And, and you often don't even realise that those patterns are triggering. So you start, the panics comes, the hyper arousal, the heart beating, and you think you're going mad because you don't always even know what's triggered. So why would you not have a drink to calm that down, you know? <laughs> if you find alcohol calms it down, great. If you find a joint calms it down, you go for that because you don't even understand why your body's reacting that way. And that then becomes something you depend on. And, and so you get into that cycle. So when you, you come off a rehab, all those trauma things surface again. And if they're not dealt with, it, you know, and, and rational therapy won't deal with it. The rational part of the brain is the front. Language develops on the left. Rational thinking is mostly on the left side of the brain. The right side of the brain controls this reaction and if you've been neglected as a baby the right side of the brain hasn't properly developed. The, the, the amygdala you can calm it from the front, from the right. A baby learns to regulate its emotions if it's, if its mother's saying oh there 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 you're upset, oh you're cross because you haven't been fed. It starts to learn what emotions are and the mother with her soothing helps it to regulate, which develops the right side of the cortex. I can't, I, I, there's more detailed explanations of the neurobiology, but basically develops on the right. If it, a baby doesn't get that early on to regulate its anger and distress from the mother, that part doesn't develop. Talking therapies develop insight. That's on the left. It doesn't connect to here. So you can begin to understand why your body is going into panic, but you can't stop it with, with talking therapies only. So, what you can learn to do, and it's why mindfulness is developing, is develop the front of the, the central part. And mindfulness and awareness of what's going on in your body will develop. This part of the brain can develop throughout your life. And if you can develop that, you can learn to calm. EMDR makes connections. It makes connections here and here and begins to develop new neural pathways so that you can overcome, the, the, to some extent, the damage here. If you don't have early damage here, then EMDR can really make the connections front to back, left to right, and calm things down. But in EMDR, you're focusing on the thought, which is in the front of the brain, the emotion, which is in the middle here, and the body sensation. Because if you think, reptilian brain, brain stem, spinal cord, links to every organ. So your gut memory in here is as important, if not more important, than your thoughts here. EMDR works with all three levels of the brain and helps you to begin to connect, to increase activity in the brain, and to file the memories here into long-term memory, where you can move forward and begin to say, that happened, but it's over. I have survived and I can learn to be different. I was powerless then, I don't have to be powerless now. The brain's remarkable, it can recover from a lot. Um, although the analogy I use often is if, if people come to me with unresolved trauma issues because they're still having nightmares or flashbacks or panic attacks or they're still getting bouts of depression um, that, that just don't go away with antidepressants or with anything else. What we do is like cleaning out a wound that's infected. And cleaning out is going to hurt. And then if you clean it out, it's going to heal over, but it's always going to leave a scar. And scars you need to be careful with. You need not to pick at them. You need not to do things that are likely to rip them open again. 